We start Unit 7 with a discussion of what is equilibrium. Now, in order to do this, we need to realize, first of all, that many reactions in chemistry are irreversible. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's say that we have a nice uh, truck here, and this looks like a classic vehicle. Maybe this was brand new back in the 1950s. But we know that over time, something is going to happen to the iron in that vehicle. It's going to rust that iron solid is going to react with oxygen gas and it's going to produce iron 3 oxide solid which we call rust. As far as we know there really isn't much of a way for this rust for this iron 3 oxide on that truck to reverse course and turn back into a nice uh, shiny vehicle with that iron instead. That's why we say that a reaction like this is irreversible. It goes only in one direction, and that direction is the forward direction. The iron reacts with the oxygen, makes the product, but we're probably not going to have the reverse of this. On the other hand, a lot of reactions, in fact, we can say that most reactions in chemistry are reversible. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's say we have this uh, fairly simple reaction right here, where we have two moles of hydrogen gas reacting with one mole of oxygen gas to create two moles of water in the liquid form. Now, perhaps you've seen this before in your chemistry class, or you've seen videos of this. I have a video of this. In fact, this is actually a screenshot of a video that I recorded a few years ago where I'm taking a balloon of hydrogen and I'm basically blowing it up and we have this fireball here and in the midst of that we're making a little bit of water. Now we can reverse that reaction. We can actually take some water and we can run a current of electricity through it like we see with this 9 volt battery and we can produce hydrogen gas and oxygen gas and we see those gases being formed as they uh, bubble up from the electrodes there. So yes, we have this reaction that is reversible. It can go in both directions. We can have a forward, a forward reaction. We can have a reverse reaction. So when that's the case, we usually just write it like this, where we have the reaction. You can write it in either direction, to be honest. It doesn't matter. But we write a double-headed arrow there. And that double-headed arrow represents the fact that this reaction can go in both directions. It is reversible. Now, what does equilibrium look like in a closed system? How can we take maybe a flask or something and illustrate what that would look like? Well, here's a typical, fairly simple chemical reaction. Hydrogen gas plus chlorine gas yields two moles of hydrogen chloride gas. So at the beginning, it would be most likely that in that flask or that container, you would put most likely just reactants. So you'd have the hydrogen and the chlorine in there, as we see in this diagram right here. Well, as the reaction proceeds, you're going to have some of those hydrogen molecules reacting with the chlorine molecules to make HCl. But remember that since this is a reversible reaction, you're also going to have some of those hydrogen chloride molecules that are going to go in the reverse direction and they're going to make H2 and, C and Cl2. So at equilibrium this might be a good representation of what you might have. Maybe you'll have mostly product but you're still going to have some of that reactant in there. Now where did that reactant come from? Well some of the HCl reacted, it went in the reverse direction and produced some of that H2 and that Cl2. So at equilibrium you're going to expect a mixture of both reactants and products. Now let's take a look at this in a mathematical way. Now in order to do this, to talk about what equilibrium is and how this works mathematically, we're going to carry out a thought experiment. So we don't do a whole lot of these in this video course, but I think this is worth it because this illustrates how equilibrium works in a mathematical point of view. Now, in order to, to, to illustrate this, we're going to imagine that we're going to a dance. Maybe it's a homecoming dance or prom or some other dance that you've been to before. And we're going to imagine that we start the dance with 300 people. There are 300 people that funnel into the gymnasium and, you know, generally speaking, at the beginning of a dance, nobody's dancing. 
people don't like dance their way into the gym or anything like that. Usually they are not dancing when they, they walk in there. So what we have here is zero dancing, 300 that are not dancing. Now, we're going to imagine that after every single song, 30% of the people that are dancing are going to sit down and, and stop dancing. And likewise, after every song, 20% of the people that are not dancing are going to get up and start dancing. So that's the, the, the basis for our calculations here. What that means is that for the first song, 30% of zero, well that's zero, will stop dancing, because there was nobody dancing to start with, but 20% of these 300 will get up and start dancing. And 20% of 300 is 60. So we have a zero going in the direction of the, of the sidelines and 60 in the direction of the dance floor. That means we're going to have a net gain of 60 in the direction of the dance floor. So for the, this next song, we're going to have 60 people dancing and 240 people not dancing. And this process is going to repeat itself after every song. 30% of 60 is 18. So 18 people after that song will sit down, but 20% of 240, which is about 48, will get up and start dancing. Now if you look at the math, that's a net direction of 30 in the direction of the dance floor. So the dance floor goes up by 30, the, the sidelines, those who are not dancing, will go down by 30. So it's 90 to 10. Notice that at every step of the way, we still have 300 people. We have not invented new people or eliminated people. There's still the same number of people, 300. After the next song, 30% of 90 are going to sit down. So that's, that's 27. And then 20% of 210 are going to get up and start dancing. So that's 42. So looking at the math, it's a net direction of plus 15 in the direction of the dance floor. So the dance floor goes up to 105, the sidelines go down by 15 to 195. And the process repeats. 30% of 105, 32, and then 20% will have 39 who get up and, and start dancing. So in, in this case, it's a direction or it's a net gain of 7 for the dance floor. So dance floor goes up to 112, the not dancing goes down to 188. And this process just keeps repeating. And maybe you can see what's, what's eventually going to happen. We have 30% you know, of 112 sit down, that's 34, and then 20% of the 188 get up and start dancing, so that's 38. So this time it's a net gain of 4 in the direction of the dance floor. So the dance floor goes up by 4, the sidelines go down by 4. And the process repeats. For the next one, it's 30% you know, of 116, so that's 35, sit down, and then 20% of 184 get up and start dancing, so that's 37. So in this song here, we have a net gain of 2 in the direction of the dance floor. So the dance floor goes up by 2, the sidelines go down by 2. You can probably see what's going to happen here, right? if we keep on doing this. So after the next song, 30% sit down, that's 35. 20% of those not dancing get up and start dancing. So this time it's a net gain of 1 in the direction of the dance floor. So it's 119, 181. What happens now? Well, after this song, 30% of our 119 are going to sit down. So that's 36. And 20% of 181 are going to get up and start dancing. That's 36. So do you see what's happened here? We have a net gain of 0 in any direction. So that means that we have the same number of people getting up and dancing as we have sitting down. So the net direction, the net change is 0. So for the next song, it's still... 119 and 181. And so guess what? That's going to repeat 36. And so it keeps on going like that. So do you see what's happened? We have attained what I guess we can call dance floor equilibrium. So when was that dance floor equilibrium established? Well, right around this spot here where we were able to say that the, the number of people that sat down was equal to the number of people who got up and start dancing. So 
what happened at equilibrium? Well, you attained a point where the net change of people on the dance floor, and likewise the number of people not dancing, basically ended up being constant. And so your, your net change was zero. Now let's analyze this for a second. Once we got to dance floor equilibrium, right around this point right here, did that mean that the dance was over? No, by no means. In fact, we could say that as long as we still have 300 people and we still have that 119 and 181 split here and the DJ is willing to keep playing and this 30%, 20% business here keeps on going, that these numbers are going to stay the same essentially forever or at least for as long as this dance continues. The dance was not over at equilibrium. In fact, you could make the case that the dance is just getting started once equilibrium is established. Now, once you got to, da to dance floor equilibrium, did the two sides, you know, the, the dancing side and the not dancing side, have equal numbers of people? And we can see that they did not. In fact, the not dancing side had a whole lot more than the side that was dancing. So I hope this, this thought experiment helps us to understand a little bit about what's happening at equilibrium. Now let, let's apply this to, to chemistry here. What equilibrium is not, first of all. Once a reaction attains equilibrium, the reaction does not stop. It's not like the reaction has, has halted once you get to equilibrium. In fact, we could make a case that the reaction is just getting started because there is a dynamic equilibrium. In fact, that's sometimes why we call this dynamic equilibrium because the forward reaction is just taking place at the same rate as the reverse reaction. At equilibrium, do not expect that the concentrations of the reactants are going to be equal to the concentrations of the products. In fact, most of the time, that's not going to be the case. You may have more uh, products, you may have more reactants, they're not probably going to be the same. At equilibrium, do not expect all the reactant to be used up. Just like in that dance floor problem, we never got to a point where all 300 people were dancing. The same thing in a chemical reaction. You're not really ever going to use up all the reactant at equilibrium. You'll still have at least some of that reactant present. So what is equilibrium? Well, once you get to equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are equal. That's what that means. So what that means from a, a macro chemistry point of view as we measure the concentrations, that means that the concentrations have stopped changing. So that's like in our dance floor problem. The number of people on the dance floor was equal all the way beyond that. And likewise, the number of people that were not dancing, once it got to that 181, concentrations or amounts stopped changing. Now, let's take a look at this graphically. I just took the, the numbers from that dance floor problem and I just graphed them. So that's all that we have here on this graph. And here we have the number of people that are not dancing in red and the number of people that are dancing graphed in blue. So the question is, first of all, at what point in the dance was movement taking place the fastest? And I think you can see that both by looking at the numbers that we did earlier and by looking at the graph here. You can see that at the very beginning, that's where the slope or the magnitude of the slope was the highest. You know, in the case of the dancing side, it shot up the fastest at the beginning, and the, the not dancing side shot down the fastest at the beginning. And so we can generalize that to chemical reactions too. We actually mentioned this all the way back in Unit 5, that at the very beginning of a chemical reaction, in most cases, that's where the reaction rate is going to be the fastest. And then as the reaction proceeds forward, the reaction eventually uh, will taper off and the concentration will eventually stop changing once you get to equilibrium like you see here. Now, once again, what does the graph look like at equilibrium? Well, as you can see, once you get to that equilibrium stage right around here somewhere, the graphs, in fact, both of the graphs 
flat line, or as we could say from an algebra point of view, the slope is equal to zero once you get to equilibrium. Now, let's take an actual chemical reaction. So we're actually going to apply this to a, a real reaction now. Here I have nitrogen gas plus three moles of hydrogen gas yield two moles of ammonia gas. This is, this is sometimes called the Haber-Bosch process for making ammonia. And we can see here that we have these three substances, and they're, they're graphed over, over time. So the first question I have here is, which of the substances starts at a zero concentration? I think you can see that pretty simply just by reading the graph. It's the NH3, isn't it? That ammonia starts at zero concentration. Now, hope that makes sense to you, because if you look back at the equation, you see that ammonia is the product. And normally, you wouldn't expect there to be any product or much product when you start the reaction. We normally start with reactants, and that's, that's kind of what we have here. The H2 and the N2 were certainly more prevalent. Now, which of the reactants, that's H2 or N2, is depleted at the faster rate? Can you tell just by looking at the graph? Hopefully, you can see that H2 is shooting down the fastest. N2 is shooting down not quite as fast. So we can say that hydrogen is depleted at the faster rate. Now, you can also, if you will remember back to Unit 5, you can look at the balanced equation and figure that out, can't you? In fact, you see that since the hydrogen has a coefficient that's three times what nitrogen is, it's safe to say that hydrogen is being depleted three times as fast as the nitrogen is. And so that makes sense. The hydrogen is shooting down, looks like about three times faster than the nitrogen. The last question I have for you here is, why is there more hydrogen than ammonia at equilibrium? And some students have a little trouble with this because you might expect that, the, that this ammonia, since it's the product, it should be like way up here at the end. But that's not always how it's going to be. There is just there evidently was just so much hydrogen, and we're just not going to make that much ammonia in this process that, as it turns out, we're going to have some excess hydrogen. We're going to have more hydrogen than we have ammonia. So in a chemical reaction, don't always expect there to be a whole lot of product, and then the reactants are all depleted to almost zero. It's not always going to be the case. It's okay for there to be not as much uh, product as there is some of the reactant. That's, that's okay. So as you look at this, this process here, I hope you're able to, uh, to see a nice introduction to equilibrium. If you learned something from this video, if you appreciated something from this, please hit that thumbs up button. I'm Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for 24 years, and I want to share what uh, I've learned over the years with you as you get ready for your AP exam. I hope you join me in my next video where we're going to move right on to Unit 7, Section 2. Thanks for watching.